Whether you've been at YouTube for a while or you're just getting started, I have got a treat for you. What you're about to watch is an interview with Sean Cannell, a YouTuber with over 1 million subscribers across three very successful channels, one of which has over 600,000 subscribers. Now this interview's over an hour long, so grab a snack, a cold drink, and enjoy. If you're joining us, welcome. I'm super excited to have Sean Cannell here video creator, all around good guy, three channels totaling over 1 million subscribers. That's how you start an interview, much better than the first take. Sean, welcome. Brian, so pumped to be here. Uh, super grateful for you and how much value you add to this community um, and all of your content. It's really amazing. Well, thank you so much. Sean, uh, tell, tell folks a little bit about your, your upcoming, your, like how you got started early and already I'm veering off the script. We're going to get to those questions, but I kind of want to get like the early Sean, like trying to make it happen kind of a vibe. Yeah, you know, uh, that's a great question. And, and I have really kind of a, a video advantage because I got into video before all this social media stuff started. And so for me, it was 2003 and I was volunteering at my local youth group uh, church and I, I didn't even want to do video. The youth pastor at just handed me a, a Canon HV 30 with mini DB tapes in it, uh, as a camcorder, right. And <laughs> Adobe premiere, which is still what I edit on today. And so that version was like 38 versions ago or something. And I just started making weekly video announcements and Brian, you know, your first videos are always going to be your worst videos. I Ooh, think. Boy. <laughs> right. And so it was cool though, because these were weekly video announcements. Think about it. I was kind of like a YouTuber. I was making at least a video a week and I was on camera and that was terrible or I was behind the camera. I was editing. I was trying to learn how to edit faster and I didn't know any of this stuff, but because I did 52 videos that first year, I was really cutting my teeth. Then the lead pastor was like, Hey, why don't you do these on Sundays now? They're not as bad as they once were. And so now I'm doing 104 videos a year as a volunteer. I'm still have other jobs and stuff. I'm waiting tables at Red Robin but I'm really learning how to edit fast. I'm getting through my process, if you will, of a lot of not great content. And this is before YouTube started. And the first YouTube channel I managed was my church's YouTube channel in 2007. And again, didn't know about thumbnails, titles, I'm doing everything wrong, but at least I was doing it. And that's what I like to encourage people. You got to just start, you know, you got to punch fear in the face, punch perfectionism <clears throat> in the face and press record. And I was so thankful that I got that opportunity because it really gave me a head start in the industry. Man, Sean, I, I so love it. And I want to share, you know, anybody that's watching this video, if you have a desire to move forward, to make it happen, as we course forward, I got a lot of questions that I know Sean can help you with, but I want you to really appreciate the best you can, the amount of time that Sean's been doing this for. It's so easy to get set up with these expectations. And, and when that happens, it's really scary. So Sean, the first question for anybody that's excited about not just like publishing a video, but really getting a message out there, amplifying their message, how can they do that? And what is the easiest way to jumpstart a new channel or a struggling channel? You know, I think the easiest way to start a new channel, in my opinion, is to start a niche-based channel. Now, that's not what I did. And I think that if you're approaching YouTube, you're not sure what you want to do, what you want to talk about, you could just start a channel kind of like me. I started a, a channel called Sean Cannell. It, I originally had a, a business channel, but on the Sean Cannell channel, you know, when I was starting out, it was all over the place. And I remember I did a vlog with my wife. We went on a date. The next day I reviewed uh, the amazing Spider-Man. The next day we were doing a uh, bark box. We have two chihuahuas. So we were unboxing a bark box and all the toys. The next day I was doing a cooking tutorial and that's not good. Like that's all over there. You know, that's not focused, but I would say this, that if you're not sure what you want to do, don't really worry about success, if you will, worry about the journey and the process and the practice, because just by publishing videos, you're learning your voice, you're getting into it. But if you want to start a channel that could succeed quickly, I think having a focused niche would be the way I'd want to do it. And so there's two examples. My friend Renee here in Las Vegas, he started a channel called Big Daddy Eats. And simply because he was like, I like food, I want to do some cooking stuff. And his niche was Whole30 because he was doing Whole30. And even though he started from scratch, 
he was able to start getting subscribers and views pretty quickly because he tapped into this existing tribe of people interested in the whole 30 content, even though he was brand new on YouTube and he ranked a couple videos and his channel is growing on autopilot, even though he hasn't really been uploading new stuff because of being in a niche. Another example is Miguel, another friend of mine here in Vegas. He's an artist, a musician, and he was uh, him and his wife make music, but he started doing videos about Ableton software and about the gear he uses to produce music and really home recording. And same thing, he tapped into a niche. So many people, and I know you hear this all the time, they want to just start a channel to inspire people. I'm just going to do talking head videos. Or I'm just going to vlog and I hope people are inspired by it. It's going to be hard to get noticed that way. It's going to be hard to stand out that way, but just like I'm a vlogger. Yeah. You and who else? Like everybody. Right. But when you pick a niche around a passion or something that's really focused and there's already a group of people, I think that's the best way to really get traction. Man, I, I so dig that. It's funny. I literally, I just posted something similar in my group earlier today about like, Hey, if you want the easy path, like do this, go down the path of choosing a niche and really focus on that because people gravitate towards greatness. Like you never saw like an Olympic uh, sprinter swimming. You never saw the, the swimmers like trying to run over hurdles and whatnot. And, and then the inspire thing, like, man, it's like these people that had, like, if I'm brutally honest, like there's, there's nothing inspiring yet. You haven't done something inspiring. So like you got to get the results, which I, I struggle to say that, but man, so, so very true. So with that, um, I think we're already kind of going down this path of how, how to really make some great decisions about a channel and how to jumpstart things. Question number two is what are some common mistakes you do see people making and, and how can they rectify those or, or fix those and move forward? I think the next mistake is once, let's say you pick a niche, you go, okay, I'm going to start making videos, making content. But if you start in your own mind with the content, what I mean is you think, okay, what do I want to talk about? What do I think people need to know? And what, and the mistake people make is they don't research before they press record. And you know, you just got to subscribe to this channel, your channel and go through some of your content and you're sharing tools uh, about how to do keyword research, how to use keywords everywhere and all these other great tutorial videos you have. I suggest that everybody watching watch those because um, when you research before you press record, it wasn't that Renee talking about Whole30 just uh, started making videos and titling them whatever. He did research to figure out what people were searching for. So it was like Whole30 kitchen, uh, chicken recipes or like Whole30 30 smoothies. And then his titles, his description, and his tags were based on the fact that we can discover what our audience potentially wants to see. And so there's kind of a combination. I think that the challenge is, well, what if it's not just all about research, it's also about your passion, it's about your knowledge, but you need both. When you kind of think about, okay, I know I'm going to be teaching Whole30, but let's go see what people are searching for. In the process of doing that research, you're like, oh, I do have a good chicken recipe. Or I could tweak this one to really answer that keyword question. So it's like a synergy of that process to really plan out. And Brian, here's the tip. Before I press record, I have a Google Doc open. I actually know what my video is going to be titled. I know what the first opening sentences of my video are going to be. And the rest is outlined. And I usually already have done my tag research as well. So I go into the video and I'm able to give a hook that is the exact promise, the opening of the video, that's the exact promise based on that research. And this came, this is a hard one mistake because you know what would happen is I used to just press record, say a bunch of stuff, shoot a bunch of stuff, get to the place of uploading and then be like, okay, so what am I titling this? And then, <laughs> and not only is that the wrong step in the process, but then sometimes what you're actually doing is you're then, you, you do some research, you're like, well, that would be a good title, but it's not quite aligned with the content that you created. And that's why when you reverse that process, you can really position your content for success. Man, love it. Otherwise you start like trying to like manipulate things. You're like, well, if I jam this here, I stick this other keyword. I like that other keyword. <laughs> 100%. It's such a process that we go through. And that's why it's really great that people can watch this entire interview really grasp what's going on uh, with these, these questions, your experience. I just want to throw this out there. Like it amazes me that you've got three channels and over a million subscribers. Like if there's anything that I can share is like follow the advice from those people that have done it before you. And, and just quick shout out uh, this book, Amazon, 
uh, find book re retailers. I think that's what they say. Just get, get your hands on this book. We'll talk more about it as we move forward. Okay, so with that, uh, I actually, I, I was going to skip a question. Question number three is you, you need to make money to pay the bills to be able to continue moving forward. And for me, like $1,000 represents like sizable income where it's uh, maybe, I guess it's not really, you know, it's maybe a, a, a week or two weeks of rent. I don't know. It's a nice car payment, a few dates. How can you get to $1,000 a month quickly on YouTube? What's the easiest path for people to make that happen? So I love this question because you know, the, what's the fastest way to get to a thousand dollars. And this might be kind of different uh, information than what people have normally heard. I think the fastest way is actually to think about uh, exchanging your time for money in a freelance uh, scenario or create kind of a higher value offering that's connected to your channel. So for example, um, we recently had an event uh, called grow with video live here in Vegas. And that one of the um, guests was, has a music channel and she's, she's got a lot of influence pertaining to people listening to her music, listening to her songs. And, but she's also struggling to monetize because even though you're getting views, AdSense is not necessarily a ton. If you're even trying to, you know, get a few Patreon supporters, that can be a challenge. And then even still, if you want to sell an MP3 or get a Spotify listen, you know, you need such high volume that it's tough to do. So it was actually uh, Brady Shearer who shared this tip. He said, well, what if you put together a kind of a coaching, it's on your website, it's like a, where you will review someone's song, so someone could submit a song to you because she has also aspiring musicians following her, and maybe it's like a $300 package or a $500 package and create a process where you're going to run it through your own framework of coaching, you're going to listen to it and give them feedback, and then maybe you're going to give them feedback later. So just figure out what you would do to help people do that. So think about that. If that was $500, you only need to sell two a month to hit a thousand dollars a month. And so AdSense, affiliate marketing, some of these other things, they're great. And we talk a lot about those and we talk about 10 different ways to make money in YouTube secrets. But I think for anybody that wants to make this practical, another uh, person I was just talking to has a career advice channel. Same thing, a lot of free uh, content around career advice, but there might be people who want to do a $100 um, you know, resume review and, and coaching so you can land your next job. And the other thing is maybe you're um, a chef, you do uh, cooking or you do meal prep and you use your channel for branding to awareness. And there's kind of that international reach, of course, because a lot of viewers can be all around the world. But maybe what you do is you actually have a local meal prep service where, again, you're doing some things where you're actually doing freelance work or service based work. And then, of course, something like you're doing, hiring you for coaching or, you know, whatever that is. That's going to be, I think, the quickest way uh, to make some serious money because some, and while you're building those other income streams. Yeah, I love that. It's so many people get sucked into this whole like, well, you know, there's the ad money or uh, super chats. And when you're just getting started, the amount of people flowing through a channel is usually smaller, but that doesn't have to mean small dollars. It's just really about how you frame it up and whatnot. And those higher ticket offers can really can really make it the difference. And, and the, the thing that I love the most about what you shared is, is probably not what people want to hear, but like the freelancing, like you can make money fast, like you can pay your bills. So thank you so much for that. Okay. And then next is, is the one you kind of talked about on some of the mistakes that you made, Sean, imagine that you made mistakes. You know, we all, man, when I look at my first few videos and like, Ooh, and I'm just talking this channel too. Uh, and I've been at it since 2007, but it, it's really easy to make mistakes. Uh, I think you just got to keep pressing forward. Uh, that being said, question number four, Sean, do you have to stick to a, a niche? Do you have to go down that path? You know, in my opinion, I think yes, but here's some freedom for people because I think sometimes that feels so narrow. You know, uh, Brian, have you heard of the uh, magazine, GQ magazine? GQ? GQ. Yeah. Oh, hello. Of course I have. <laughs> of course you have. What, what, what magazine is it? Like, what's it about? It's about, it's about dressing well, uh, looking good, caring yourself. Ge it's about being a gentleman. It's about being a gentleman. So would you say it's a niche magazine? 
It's, it's uh, very, very much specifically targeted at one group, a demographic of individuals. And I, I, I'm struggling not to answer these myself. So go ahead, Sean. <laughs> but no, but, but you, you hit it. So, so you know GQ. It's, it's kind of a men's lifestyle. It's also not like a young men's streetwear brand, but it's kind of more of like it's gonna, you're going to dress up a little bit. But what's so interesting is I think GQ, it's an incredibly clear brand. And one of the ways you can niche down is by actually having a very clear target audience. But what's funny is in the pages of GQ, you actually might get summer movie reviews to watch. You might get uh, some recipes for the barbecue at your house. You'll get some fashion tips. And you might get an interview with an athlete or some kind of an entrepreneur. And so I think that on YouTube, yes, you could create a channel just about gardening or just about YouTube tips or just about underwater basket weaving, right? But what you also could do is you could create, you just need a clear theme. You need a clear promise and you want a clear target audience. So if you subscribe to the GQ YouTube channel, which I don't even really know if there is one, but if there was, I would know like, okay, I'm hitting subscribe because I may or may not care about the recipe videos, but I want to be a part of this kind of whole movement. And as they pump, pump out new content, some of the stuff I'm going to like, but it's all on brand. It's still focused. And to be honest, it's still niched down. So if you don't, if you want to have a variety channel, I would just encourage people make sure that there's a cohesive message, a cohesive promise, and really also probably a target audience. So on the flip side, maybe you're, ta you're targeting just young millennial entrepreneur females, and you're talking about, sure, there's going to be online video tips, but maybe software tips and career advice. And so maybe there's mindset, there's inspiration, maybe there's even diet tips, but what's all going into this mentality of millennial female entrepreneurs or something like that. I think that's the other opportunity and niche that some people overlook. Man, I, again, just I, I, love the, I love the answers you're coming up with today. I think it's really important for us as video creators to really have a clear understanding of where we're trying to go. And unfortunately, I see so many people, they don't have a clue. And then they don't understand why people don't get it. It's like, well, you don't get it. Like, how is the rest of the world supposed to get it? So thank you so much for, for sharing that. I love the, uh, the GQ. I'm like, GQ, I mean, dude, I'm older than you. I mean, I'm, come on now, by a, a good amount of years here. <laughs> okay, this is, this is kind of a tricky question here. I just hope you're ready for this one. I'm ready. Sean, uh, what kind of equipment do we need to create high-quality videos? Um, yes, equipment is, is one of my favorite topics. Of course, my channel, Think Media, I talk about a lot of things. You know, I like to just share the basics first, and that is this. Every time before you press record, ask yourself, how's the AVL? And you can remember that acronym, right? Or that's what it's called, AVL. What's it stand for? How's the audio, video, and lighting? Now, the cool thing is I really believe to create high-quality videos, all you need is a smartphone, and everybody's got one now. However, and that's going to be your video. That's going to be HD, maybe 4K. You're good to go. But cameras work off light. And so I think one of the biggest things a lot of creators could invest in is lighting. And mm. so um, getting their lighting leveled up and audio. In fact, a lot of people will tolerate maybe lower video quality, but they will have, be very impatient with low audio quality. If it's echoing in the room or it's tinny or it's hard to hear, there's a buzz or, you know, it's, it's too it's concrete and there's sound bouncing everywhere. So I think that investing, if you could just start with your smartphone, you invest in maybe a light kit, something could be as cheap as $80 for two soft boxes on Amazon, and then maybe a plug-in lavalier microphone or something of that sort. That's what I think is the key to get to starting to create um, high quality videos. Now we go, we could go deep into, um, yes, maybe you want to get into a DSLR or mirrorless camera. And I think that's probably important as you progress. But I like to encourage people that it's always going to be about the content and never about the camera. And that content value is infinitely more important than production value. So you can start with what you have. You can start getting your message out there and then upgrade as you go along and level up that production value. Yeah, we all want to have the toys. There's no question about that. But man, it's, it's a bummer when people are on the sidelines and they're like, well, I don't have the stuff. And I'm like, I get it. I want the stuff too. But the sooner you get started, the sooner you start dialing in your presentation, how you deliver, your presence on camera, and that, that takes kind of a while, you know? In fact, let's just go off script. Are, are you good? Yep. 
how do you pull your presentation and your delivery together to really connect with people behind the screen? So some of the things I do and think about. Yeah. What I, just, you know, just, we're just kind of riffing here. I'm yeah. throwing a, a couple curveballs your way. Cause that's kind of how I roll. I love it. So one of the uh, first things I would say is questions. I think questions create curiosity, questions engage the audience, questions cause uh, the, the viewer to think. Uh, when all you do is give answers, you know, some of the greatest communicators in history have asked some of the most powerful questions and they would communicate through questions. So for example, even at the beginning of most of my videos, I a lot of times lead with the question like, so what is, uh, you know, the best way to grow your YouTube channel in 2018? And that person might think about that. Or, you know, have you ever noticed how frustrating it is to get your videos to look well? I know, getting lighting right is tough. It's like, yeah, I have noticed that. So it actually pulls people in. Sometimes when we drone on by just making statements, just like declaring information or just going c constantly, uh, people can tune out. And so questions are also a pattern interrupt because all of a sudden they're like, well, I was asked a question. And they're also a good way to re-engage your audience throughout the video. And so a kind of cadence I've been learning lately and I'm always picking up tips. I think uh, Phil DeFranco is... Uh, my wife and I watch his, you know, his show every night for our news. And so even mid video, I've also found a lot of times asking questions where I'll say, you know, um, I was shooting with my Canon M50 the other day, but it was kind of frustrating because the thing got connected. Have you ever noticed that? Do you ever get frustrated? Like mid video, I'll return back to the audience and, and maybe say, have you noticed? Let me know in the comments. It's not the question of the day, just a way to engage. I think that is a major thing that I like to focus on um, of for trying to connect to that person on the other side of the camera. It's not just a lecture. You're trying to make it a conversation. Now, it's also not as much, especially if it's not live, it's not going to actually be a conversation, but you can get close to that by using powerful questions. Man, I, I really love that because to me, that, that's what separates those that have from those that have not. And just being able to really create a sense of uh, communication and, and like there is that conversation. And I love the idea of a question. I love, it's just really fun to hear about how other video creators do this stuff. I got okay, another one so for you as far as going off script. One other one would be uh, also to, uh, this is maybe, it depends on what your niche is, but for me, um, I try to also tap into emotions because we're all human and we all have shared human emotions, meaning I do tech gear reviews. And so, um, you know, if you're reviewing a camera, that's, that's powerful. And you can just talk about the facts. There's a sensor size, there's the shutter speed, there's the whatever, but then why does it matter? And what I've learned, especially, uh, Heather on my team, she's got a couple kids and, and we did a video recently where we were testing out some gear and so what I was, I review cameras, right? And so I talk about cameras, but it's not just about the sensor. It's not just about the slow motion. What is the point of all that? So sometimes I'll say, you know, and what I love about this is I love the slow motion because, you know, maybe you're out on a weekend shooting videos with your kids and you want to capture some precious moments and see every detail. Or maybe, you know, you're actually at a, a child's graduation or, or you're um, at uh, a, somebody in your family that's getting married. I'm kind of just trying to say that when you bring it into the human experience and when you can also bring the emotions into things that normally would, you would just think like a CNET review typically is not going to take it there. It's like, it's got a big screen. It's got a fast processor and maybe even a few other details, but really content could be infinitely more powerful and connect much more deeply in your audience. When you contextualize it to the why it matters the emotions that come with that. Because what I ultimately want, people don't even ultimately want a camera. I mean, you and I do, like, you, I guess we love cameras, we love tech, but you want the result it produces. You want its ease of use. You want the memories it creates. You want the experiences that you can have with friends at Vid Summit if we're hanging out and shooting together. That's all emotional. That's, that's, all, that's not technical. And so that's just <clears> another <throat> tip that I like to think about um, whenever possible to weave that into my content. Cause at the end of the day, we're trying to connect with people. We're not connecting with robots. So, yeah, you know what? It's cool. Like I'm thinking PewDiePie, who is a master of this, like, The amount of spam calls at this household is through the roof. We've got oh, a yeah. landline. I bet you don't have a landline. I have a cell phone, but I've been using the same number for so many years. It's constant. It's constant. I it's so bad. Calls. Yeah. Um, 
So PewDiePie, man, he, he like, he's sad, he's happy, he's crying, and all of that happened in like 16 and a half seconds. It's, it's genius. But, and I was thinking of that, and then I thought, you know, this really reminds me of the pivot that Steve Jobs and Apple made. Um, they came out with, I think it was like the Lisa, and they took out like this 20-page ad in the World, Wall Street Journal, and it's all these specs and all this crap that like a very small percentage of the audience cares about. And then Steve Jobs gets fired and he comes back 10 years and he's like, no, we don't do that anymore. It's think different. And now when you look at their marketing, it's really not about the megapixels. It's about look what you can do. Like we really uh, value creatives. We value people that can create the cool stuff. It's about what we can do with it. So really cool answer their uh, emotion and asking questions, really powerful stuff, Sean. Okay, so now let's, let's pivot a little bit, let's stay on tech. Now we have a bit of a budget. Like we've been doing this a while, like our spouse is seeing this as serious, opened up the, uh, the bank account, we get a thousand bucks, what do we buy? Yes, okay, uh, so I've got this dialed in. Uh, Canon M50. Yeah, totally, that's, I love that's gonna be. $699. Here's why. It, it's absolutely, in my opinion, still the number one best camera for YouTube. Now, what some people will say is, no, I want to get, you know, Sony's a7 III because it's got IBIS and it's got this sensor and it's got all this stuff. Well, if you know what that is, then that is the camera you should get because that's awesome. You know what that is. But for 99% of content creators, you're not, you're not actually filmmakers. You know, you're not trying to do all this crazy stuff. You want a camera that's easy to use, that has the flippy screen, that you can tap your face and have really good autofocus the entire time, that's uh, got a touch screen, that um, it stays in focus, that has the mic input. It's got everything you need simple to use. And whether you're an entrepreneur, you're just doing cooking videos, you're doing gardening videos, it's got amazing quality. And so, um, Canon M50, $700, um, lighting kit. There's one from studio pro, um, a hundred dollars on Amazon, $99, two softbox lights, the Boya BYM one lavalier microphone, $20. You could plug that in. So you could do one person on camera and then also buy the Tascar shotgun mic for $24. So for two mics, you're at about 50 bucks and that can go on top of the camera for vlogging or for even two people on camera. Then you're also going to want to buy, uh, my favorite's this newer tripod right now. I think it's, $25 or 30 bucks. Um, and, uh, really cool. It goes to 70 inches. Most people probably don't need that. But one thing I've learned being six, one is that most tripods are actually too low for me. And ideally you usually want the camera at eye level pointed down a little bit. And so most tripods are like pointed up a little bit if they're too short. And so, um, and the nice thing is even if you are shorter, having a tripod that could go to 70 inches is nice and doesn't have to break the bank. And, um, then you've got your, lighting, you've got your tripod, you've got, you need to get an SD card, grab a 32 gigabyte sand disc for about $32. And all of that's going to actually come in around 800, 850. But depending on where you are around the world, that's what I would do for about a thousand dollars. And that's going to be a killer YouTube kind of studio setup to get started. Man, that's awesome. I actually have one too. And I was really excited about that, that camera when it came out, just the size of it and the portability. And, and now I'm like, continuing and I'm laughing at myself. I'm like a little ahead of in, in my own head of where the story is going. It's like, I'm laughing at myself because I worked so hard to get like my studio lighting all dialed in, but now I got this whole other element and it's like, so I've got like, it's a plus and then I've got like B minus. But again, I think that's the journey. And I actually, I'm, I'm kind of embracing it. I'm like you suck there. Like you've got work to do, like get it together. And that M50, uh, there are some people right now that are like, it doesn't shoot 4k and you probably don't own a computer that can really handle that process. And until you've edited 10 4K videos, slow the heck down. Like really, like 10K or 10K, could you imagine 10K? <laughs> I don't even know, like that's some kind of supercomputer like in Iowa or something that can handle that. But um, yeah, really good, really good setup. It's cool what you can get these days for, you know, uh, basically less than $1,000, unbelievable. And we didn't really touch on it, but that is a good point. Uh, the cool thing, which you need a computer as well eventually. And I actually think that best bang for your buck is probably like a PC. 
And I think you can get a video, an HD video editing machine for probably around $500, $600. Like if you really work on it and you know, maybe 700 by the time you have the monitor and all the accessories, but that just proves again, I don't know why people are so fixated on 4k. I think that HD is, is good enough. And, and even us, the speed of workflow, even with fast computers, 4k does slow you down. And so having your speed of workflow, um, just be as fast as possible. That's really all you need. You could take over the world with a $500, you know, $700 computer that setup we just described and create some really, really amazing co uh, content. And I just want to say, what camera were you shooting, shooting on with your recent premieres video? I saw you outside. Love that video, by the way. You got the sunset. There's that deer behind you. Um, was that your Sony or? Um... No, that was the M50. Okay. Yeah. That looked great. Well, you know, it's funny too. And, and, and I kind of mentioned like all the mistakes that I'm making and I realized I was in the menus the other day just to kind of go nerdy for a second here. And I was, I think I had some setting for the daytime. It's like ND filter, same kind of thing where it's going to bring the lighting down or the midtones or something. And I kind of realized like inside then when I'm inside the studio, like I want that off and just, it's, it's tough to like manage all the things, but man, that camera is, is really powerful. And, and for me, I kind of want to just back up what you're is talking about with editing and things like that. Because for me, the value that you can bring to your video when you sit down or somebody edits it that knows what they're doing, wow, night and day difference. And when you take the tip that you led with today, Sean, like know what the heck you're going to make a video about. Like it's got to be snappy. It's got to be on point. If, if you have this video covering three or four different subjects, it's really hard for people to understand. But if you have one subject, everything becomes easier. It's like a thumbnail, a title, a concept, and then you edit it and it like, wow, you can add a lot of visual interest when you edit. Like so many people ask me when I shoot indoors, like, wow, what's that camera? I'm like, it's a Sony a6300. But what you're seeing is, is, you know, the color correction and just a little bit of crisp sharpening and, and a lot of things that took me a long time to get, get, the, get the hang of. So, Love it. Uh, okay, next question, Sean. This, this, is a, this is a good question. I get this one every now and then. How many videos does it take to succeed, to get views, to start growing, to see growth? So, uh, I'll take this a couple different ways. I think that, um, I think that if I was thinking about how often, number one, I think you should think about YouTube kind of like a small business. And for a lot of small businesses, they say it takes 24 to 36 months until you're profitable. So I actually think that the right mindset, the right mentality people should approach YouTube with is with honest, honestly, like a three year, at least commitment now you can certainly experiment and, and not just say like, it's, it's better be three years or not, but just a willingness to say, I'm going to put my head down and I'm going to work at this consistently for, for three years, just to kind of get things going, to kind of learn the ropes, to kind of ramp up because there's a lot to learn. And then saying that, I would say that if possible, a weekly upload for about that amount of time. And I think that once a week is, is a good baseline. A lot of people say, you know, more can trigger the algorithm. And, and there's also examples of people posting less. But to me, I just think that weekly should be the goal. I think that if you have a niche focused channel, in meaning you're not daily vlogging or something like that, you can batch produce content. And so uh, a lot of people, for the people I help and the people I coach, a lot of them are busy. They have other things going on and YouTube is a side thing or it's a support thing to their business or to their nonprofit or to their church. And so a lot of them will batch. They'll shoot 12, 12 shoot days a year, four videos each time. And one video comes out a week and they're committed to uploading once a week. And they'll make, and some of them, uh, like I'm thinking about Crystal Sparks, who's uh, this awesome YouTuber and doing a lot of kind of faith driven content. And she's had her weekly show for a couple of years and it's been slow and steady. Her audience has never exploded. She doesn't have thousands of subscribers, but she has a lot of depth. She does some coaching. I think she has a course. She's got um, a book and, and it, she's doing great. And she's, it's speaking engagements and all these things. And her YouTube channel is this baseline. It's this place where people know where her pillar of content comes out, just comes out once a week. And there's something powerful about the fact that she's done it for so long. Because I know a lot of us, we want overnight results. We even want um, results after two months, results after three months. 
But some of us have not realized the power of just doing something simple. And it's so tough, but something like simple is one video a week for three years, the kind of momentum that can create by as you refine the process, as you get better at it, maybe build an email list. And every Tuesday, you send that email out and say, hey, this week's episode is out. You can build a lot of momentum if you apply time and consistent strategic effort. Man, fantastic. So many people will talk about like how many videos are like going daily and the volume, quantity or quality. And I, I've seen so many channels blow up with one video a week. And personally for me, I think there's a time and space where creating a lot of video content can up your game. You learn a lot faster, obviously. You're, you're touching the buttons a lot more. But sooner or later, like you just got to catch your breath and like one a week is, is plenty. I've seen so many amazing creators and they always err on less but higher quality. And I see so many other people that haven't had the success and they're kind of like spaghetti against the wall. So, man, just uh, one video a week. And I love what you just said, sometimes creating a lot of content, we call those sprints. So even for us, our goal is to say, look, we need to get a video out a week, no matter what. I missed it this year when we had our conference. It was so crazy. And I was like, you know what? And even, even though we have team and I was like, it's, well, we're, we're going to miss a week. So we actually went a week, but probably for the last couple of years, I've never missed at least one a week. And even though we kept the capacity to do more, that's a baseline. But we call them sprints when we potentially, and I'll tell you when that's coming up soon, is Black Friday, Cyber Monday. As a tech YouTuber, um, at the beginning of November, I'm going to go on a sprint. And I might come out of, and, and I don't even know if this is good or bad. We also do it during CES, which is a tech show here in Vegas. We'll probably go daily. I mean, I'll probably do five videos a week on a sprint. Kind of let people know, this is. there's a lot to talk about. There's a lot of new tech or there's a lot of comparison videos batch those all together. And I've seen those to be a good boost, but I want to encourage people. And that is that it doesn't, it's up to you. Once you start that, it doesn't mean you can't stop that. It's like, it's like a launch, it's like a, it's like Netflix released, you know, 10 new episodes of your favorite show, but then you don't get them, the new ones for maybe a while. So it's like, you could put out some high volume. And I even recommend people do that. A friend just said they did a 31 day challenge to upload a video every day. They said it was tiring. They had a full-time job. It was really tough but they learned so much. They got mm -hmm. better at their craft. And so the cool thing is, I don't think you have to, we feel like if we, we, once we daily vlog, like we could never turn back. We have to daily vlog for the next hundred years. Well, that might be intense. How about just give yourself a month and, uh, and do a sprint. Yeah. Really good stuff for sure too. And it's like, I think a lot of times we get so hung up on all these rules and it's good just to say, Whoa, <laughs> like you got to publish a video consistently. A video a week, great. But, and, and that's kind of it. Like if you, if you focus on the most important stuff, like right now, I just kind of tweaked my flow because I'm like, I just want to free myself up to publish more. And if I'm sitting on a video for three days because my next publish day is Monday or Tuesday, that's slowing me down. So in, in the end, I, I, I'm going to be publishing more, which I feel is good if, as long as the quality is good enough. But Anyway, yeah, that's one of the things that I did that really helped me learn a lot was just, I went 56 days straight. Now, this is what I do for a living, so it was a lot easier. I don't know how those people with jobs and all the other things, how they pull that off. That's amazing. <laughs> they're, they're probably younger than me. <laughs> yeah, it, it is crazy. My wife and I, years ago when I had a full-time job, um, uh, it, we vlogged for about 60 days straight nonstop. And man, I, I, I understand why it can burn you out because it was super, I mean, I would, I was editing late. Yeah, exactly. I would edit when I get home, I think like finish in the morning and then I'd rush off to work and it was too much. And so, uh, the final thing I'd say there too, is you mentioned if, if I had to pick quality over quantity, I'd pick quality every day, every day. Yeah. Because especially on YouTube, with the being a search engine and you, t you talk a lot about this, you know, cream rises to the top, no matter how many cups of coffee you pour. And so a lot of your videos have such an evergreen opportunity that they don't on other platforms where maybe you should live stream on Facebook every day because you just need to stay top of mind, but it's always getting pushed down. YouTube's different. YouTube's a search engine. So you could create one high quality video in January and it could still be getting views the next January or three years later. So it's worth putting in that extra effort and maybe putting out less volume and higher quality that can continue to be watched and viewed by people. 
Yeah, awesome. Thank you for that. Okay, so this is kind of uh, one of the pillar questions in our industry, and that is how can someone that is brand new with the, the whole zero views, zero subscribers, how can I grow? Is it even possible? I'm just not sure it's possible. So it's a great question. I think the first thing I'd want to say is the mentality. And the first mentality is you got to kind of get into beast mode. You got to click in to a, a scrappiness, to hustling, because you're at zero. And the reality is this though, everybody starts at zero. So you can be encouraged that, um, that other people have been down this road. And if somebody else has been able to do it, you can do it too. The second thing is though, not necessarily everybody starts at zero because you got to audit what, what assets do you have? You, you mean, you probably already have friends or you might already have some social media followers or you already have some other people in your life, but maybe you don't. So what are we talking about? Zero, you lived on a desert island and you don't have parents and whatever, or like, so, so thinking about that, I think what you want to think is by any means necessary. That's why it's a mentality. So we just got into just nuanced tactics. Like if you launch a YouTube channel, put that link in your email, uh, you know, your email bio, like under your name. So that every time you send an email, it says, Hey, I just launched a new YouTube channel about whatever. Check it out here. You know, use Twitter, use social media. You, you're like, I only have 10 followers. Great. Maybe one will care about your YouTube channel. Use your personal Facebook page. Um, well, I don't know if my friends and family will care by any means necessary. And one of the other terms I like to use is generating. So when I was first starting um, on YouTube, even years ago, understanding comments and even backlinks and social triggers. And, and uh, as I was researching some of these things, I was like, like, Hey mom, can you watch my video today? And look, let it play. Cause I need the watch time, watch time and leave, <laughs> and, and leave, leave a comment on it too. And like, I don't even care about YouTube. Look, you don't have to watch it. Just let it play in the background, mom. I'm trying to get this thing off the ground. That's a mentality of like, well, you're trying to manufacture. No, you're trying to get your YouTube channel off the ground so you can reach new people and get into the algorithm. You just got to hustle. <clears throat> so use social media, use LinkedIn. Um, and you know, depending on, and this, I, I would say that for most people, you should not use any kind of paid ads. I think that paid ads are, um, are gasoline for a fire that's already burning and even not necessarily good for organic growth. They're good if you have some way to monetize and something to sell, but even still, I mean, uh, YouTube display ads would be what I use to show up in the thumbnails or at the top. And again, to the tune of $5, $10, like if you, if you like buy a Starbucks every day for $5, why, why would you not invest that into your YouTube channel again and just make some U-Ban or some Folgers and figure it out for a while? That's why I'm saying hustle, like mentality. I got to grow this thing. I'm calling people. I'm knocking on doors. You know what I mean? And what's funny is it's the same as, as anything. Like how do you get a business to get found? Yellow pages, billboards, social media, door to door, print flyers, chamber of commerce, toastmasters, friend of a friend, call somebody, like make a list, like, and then study, buy some books on marketing, 500 ways to market, 150 different ways to, you know what I mean? Like, and so, and without even necessarily answering the question, although I may have said, said a few things, the biggest thing I think is to get that beast mode mentality that like, I'm going to just hustle on this thing. I'm not just going to upload a video and sit there and wait and think people are going to come find this channel. I'm going to just do whatever I can to get the word out. And, uh, you know, well, people might think you're being too pushy about it. Well, do you believe in it or not? Do you want it to work or not? And if you do, then go after it with all your heart and soul and push. You know, I think when you adapt that too, when that becomes who you are, like some, not everyone might like it. Like, I think that's kind of what you're getting at. But I'll tell you, beyond a shadow of a doubt, people are going to freaking notice. And when you're still doing that six months later, because most people won't make it six months. It's sad but true. Like, the numbers don't lie. But when you make that, that that's my stake your claim. That's like, you know, stop wondering, hey, is it going to work? No, just say it's going to work. Like, get out of my way. Like, kick down the door of opportunity. And when you, when you start living that way, people are like, wow, I want to be a part of this. I'm curious. I want to watch this journey. So... That's really fantastic. I dig this. Well, so, and I want to just call, can I call somebody out really quick? Yeah, please. I mean, call somebody out. But, uh, but, but yeah, and one thing to say, I love how you said, you know, stick it out. Most people will make it to six months. Here's what I've learned. 
And this is where, if, if you're listening to this, really have some self-awareness. You know, one reason why a lot of us don't have trust or sometimes even our friends and family members don't believe in us is because we have never proven ourselves to be consistent at something. And so what happens is, again, if you go, I'm launching a YouTube channel, because I've seen this probably hundreds of times now. I'm launching a YouTube channel. Most people are like, yeah, you probably aren't. And I'm not even, they're not haters. They're saying, we'll see if that lasts. And because what ends up happening is it doesn't last. That's why when you think of not just six months or three months, but you think of three years, I've learned that it almost takes a year just for people to be like, oh man, she was serious. Yeah, <laughs> like, oh man, that right? guy actually was serious. And that year process, you know, you really want to use your time in obscurity to prepare you for popularity. So if you're posting on a channel with zero subscribers, you know, I know you want to grow. I know you want views. I know you want subscribers, but switch the focus. S look at it as a way to craft your own message to show up for yourself. The first person you need to have confidence in is that you can say you're going to do something and you show up and do that thing consistently and be proud that at the end of a year, you're like, I've got 52 videos to look back on. I've only got 13 subscribers, but now I can build on the foundation of the lessons I've learned, the connections I've made, the mistakes I've made, and just going through a process of actually staying consistent for 12 months. And you might be like, hey guys, I'm still here. I'm still showing up. And I've seen that sometimes people will be late adopters. It's not that they don't believe in you immediately. It's just that they probably don't believe. Again, you're like, look, I have a new show. Come watch it. And they're like, yeah, that's going to probably burn out in three weeks. And guess what? Most of the time it does. So you need to prove you're going to be consistent and build that trust and credibility. And then I see people are like, whoa, this, this guy's really showing up with value. She's really showing up and she's been doing it for a while. I can expect this to be around uh, for the long term. So now I do want to buy into the movement, the message, <clears throat> the messenger. Yeah, that's awesome. And it's, and what's so cool about that is when you hold yourself accountable to that and you go, go down that path, you get what you want. People, someone today on my Facebook profile, they're like, wow, dude, you know, because it's a noisy world. Like Steve Jobs, we live in a really noisy world and it's not going to, we can't expect everyone to like know everything about what we're, what's going on in our lives. Like we're, we're living our lives, but our expectations of how other people are going to react is, it's kind of out of whack for a lot of people. But if you just stick with it, so, so very powerful. Um, so tell me about the book. Tell me about what's happening with this. I'm really excited that like you're an author now. Welcome to the club. I've got two. I've got like that. That's going to be that's going to be a New York Times bestseller too. <laughs> My first book, I said it was going to be a New York Times bestseller and it wasn't. But I did, I did do well though. I think just try, striving to do something worthwhile. So tell me about uh, YouTube Secrets and how we got here, Sean. So amazing. How does it feel to have a book with your name on it? It feels, uh, it feels really special. And um, it's, been, it's been an emotional week. It came out September 2015, 2018. Uh, September September 25th, 2018, co-author Benji Travis, who's the co-founder of Video Influencers. And we're really excited about this book. And you know, it's actually been about a four-year process. Um, and I'm proud to say that we really feel that it was done right and not rushed. In fact, we put the pause button on two different times because it was solid, but it wasn't great. And we wanted to say, this is going to be packed full of value. And here's how it breaks down. There's really two parts in the book. In the first part of the book, we have the seven C's of YouTube success. And, you know, it's hard to write a book about social media because it's always changing. But what's cool is that actually the principles, the psychology, the methods, the frameworks, a lot of those are actually not changing. And you need, if you're going to build a house, it starts with a solid foundation. And so a lot of times, if you think about it, the foundation is the most important part because if the foundation's wrong, the house will not stay up, won't stay standing for long. Or as soon as a hard season comes, it will get knocked down as soon as a storm comes. And, but the house is where all the, the, the sexiness is. Oh, you get to, you know, once you get the walls up, you put paint on the walls, you get the windows up, you get all that going. That's where, wow, you know, you eventually hang that TV up and you, you have that incredible master bedroom. 
that's where all the visuals are. The foundation is not impressive at all, but it's like one of the most important things. And so the first part is the seven C's of YouTube success. It's all about laying that solid foundation. And then the second part, it's all about advanced tactics and tips for growing and some more recent stuff. And so we really feel while the book can't ultimately probably be timeless, we believe that it, it can be pretty timeless for the next decade, you know, like to really offer some value about the psychology, the, uh, the best practices and the principles, as well as some very ninja stuff that people can get into right now. TubeSecretsBook.com. Physical book is out. Audio book is out. All the Amazons around the world should have it, whether that's Australia, Mexico, of course, US, UK, um, and the other formats are coming. So we're, we're going to be rolling it out on Google and, and uh, iTunes and the audiobook is about a month out towards probably the beginning of no- November for sure. It'll be out in all the different formats. And we're very, very um, excited about it. Yeah, that's fantastic. Congratulations. And for me, I think what you talked about was the strategy and, and some timeless marketing, well, again, strategies. And the fact of the matter is those don't change. And they're applicable. They're ac- I'm not going to even try to say it. It's just I can see it's already going downhill. Like you can apply those to a book launch, to blogging, to video marketing, to sales and persuasion. And that stuff is, is, is so powerful. And, and I'm really excited. I just got this in the mail like a day or two ago. Thank you so much for, for the copy here. I'm excited to share it with other folks. And obviously in this video, do this. If you're watching this now, jump to Amazon, buy this book. Uh, Sean, where else can people find you? Um, like, yes. Like they can't find you, dude. Come on. It's ridiculous. Uh, all, the inf- <laughs> all the information is on uh, tubesecretsbook.com. My website, seancannell.com. That's S-E-A-N. Um, cannell, C-A-N-N-E-L-L.com. And uh, what we're doing there, you know, Think Media, uh, talking about the best tips and tools for building your influence with online video. And then Video Influencers um, with Benji. We have a weekly interview show. And uh, we also share some tips over there. And so, yeah, uh, we're, we're passionate. You know, one of our missions right now is to help 10,000 people create a full-time living doing what they love and making a difference with online video. And we're really passionate about YouTube right now, but we're also uh, passionate about a lot of other platforms. We're paying a lot of attention to LinkedIn video right now. Of course, Instagram is hot. And so YouTube is, is the juggernaut. It's the king, the king of online video. But online video is the king of social media and the internet. You know, even Cisco did a study that 90% of the content on the internet by 2019, 2020 is going to be video. And so mastering video, learning video, learning the proven principles, as well as the nuances of the different platforms is something that I personally believe every human needs to pay attention to. Whether you're a stay-at-home mom or a business tycoon or a network marketer, Online video is going to be so integral. It's already, but it's going to be so integral to our life. Just like growing up, we needed to learn like Microsoft Word and Excel. Like just like growing up, you needed to learn like, you know, your mathematical tables. I don't even know what to call them. Apparently, I wasn't paying attention in that class. <laughs> but I, but I, feel like, I feel like online video is just becoming, it's, it's, gonna, it's one of the most valuable skills in our culture and it's going to continue to go up as far as it being the way we communicate and the way churches or businesses or nonprofits or anything you want to do, or even just seeing what your kids are doing, you got to know about online video. And so that's the mission that we're on. And we're really excited about this piece all about YouTube. Well, excellent. I've got links uh, below in the description to Sean's many websites and book launches and the Amazon thing. So check those out. Uh, If you're not subscribed to Video Influencers, you definitely want to do that. I'll have a link for that as well as Think Media. That's Sean's channel. One of your first channels is actually Sean Cannell. That was kind of like, was that the first stepping stone into like, I'm going to have my own thing now? Well, so, you know, there was a stat that said that successful entrepreneurs that have started small businesses or businesses have 2.6 failed businesses before their first successful business. And my first channel was actually that church channel. If you, it was, I was the one managing it in 2007. And, um, that it's you know, for other reasons that church no longer exists. Um, so I guess that was a failed YouTube channel, but I learned a lot. Then I had my clear vision media channel. It's just kind of a portfolio. Um, and I, but I wondered why it wasn't growing because that's, I started my business. I was doing videos for business owners and, um, 
other people setting up their website. And what I should have been doing was actually creating value-based content, educating them on like, what's your website needs? And guess what? I'm the answer or how to make a powerful video for your business. And guess what? I'm the answer. But what I was doing was I was just uploading. Again, I didn't have clarity. I needed this book. I needed to understand the whole process. So that channel didn't go anywhere. Then we started a channel called Think International. That really it wasn't that it was a failure. It was that um, we grew to about 10,000 subscribers, but I started with a friend of mine and we moved to different states. So that kind of just got put on pause. The reason Think Media is called Think Media, it's just because that channel was called Think International. And I don't even know why it was called Think International. People are like, well, the name is so powerful. I'm like, it, just, it was the media side uh, and that channel is all about leadership. And then I started Sean Cannell and it was probably successful. I mean, it has quite a bit of subscribers, but they're not engaged really. It's kind of dead. And, and, and I made a few dollars off of affiliate marketing and a few niche videos, but I never had clarity as far as the brand there. So Brian, I just bring all that up. It's just to say, again, right now we've got these two channels that are like on fire and they're doing great. There's a lot of, if you will, failures that, that lead, led to that. And I heard a quote recently that said, you know, the, the professional has failed more times than the beginner or amateur has even tried. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're saying the word failure and I'm thinking stepping stones. <laughs> stepping stones. Sometimes you win, sometimes you learn. Yeah. I actually don't view those as failures. I view those as the critical components that gave me the clarity for the projects that we've launched most recently. Thank you so much for spending time. This is going to be a, a really great video filled with so much information. You are a wealth of knowledge. I wish you luck on the book and the 10,000 the 10,000 uh, uh, lives changed, your, your personal, your mission, your goal. It's great to have those things. And I'll see you in a few weeks at uh, Vid Summit and try to get some R&R here. <laughs> Book launch week is a little hectic. I've been, I've been there. <laughs> Very hectic. Thank you so much. Love what you're doing. Really appreciate um, you having me on and appreciate being in the same class with a best-selling author like yourself. There you go. Two authors. <laughs> Cheers, Sean. I'll see you next time. And if you're new to the channel, it's, you know, this is so long. There's going to be like 16 of you watching. If you're one of the 16, high five. <laughs> All right. I'll see you guys next time. Thank you so much, Sean, for coming by.